Right. Um, so yes, thank you very much for inviting us today. We're really, really interested in doing this. Before we get started, um, we're going to get you all to, to be a little bit interactive today. So if you have a smartphone, would it be okay for you to scan the Padlet link that's on the screen in front of you um, and answer question one? So question one is, what would you call a collective noun for a group of gamers? And we're going to start you off. Uh, our contribution, we think we should call them a herd of nerds. <laughs> so if you just want to scan the code uh, and then when the Padlet pops up, give us your um, opinion. I'll pop the answers up in a second. If you can't use the if you can't use the the QR code, feel free to just pop the answer in the chat as well. A click of a clique of geeks, I like that. Gaggle of gamers. A roll of oh, a roll of rogues. Okay, everybody, just a bit of fun, that one, but really what that was designed to do was to, was to get you all onto the Padlet. So maybe I should start with introducing myself and my colleagues who are here uh, today to talk to you. So um, first and foremost, my name is Steve Montague Kearns. I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds. I'm also the co-founder with Craig Newbury-Jones of LEGEND, which is an acronym which we absolutely made work uh, for a group or, or a knowledge exchange group called Legal Education Games. Evaluation Network uh, Dissemination. This is an international research network that we've set up for uh, legal academics who are interested in talking about games more generally. Uh, and really, once we do is we come together every couple of months and just have a chat. Uh, we show our work, we show what we're doing, uh, what we're up to now. Five continents, over 100 academics, doing quite well. Um, Craig, do you want to come on and introduce yourself? Uh, hello everyone, um, I'm uh, Dr Craig Newby jones I am an Associate Professor in Law at the University of Exeter. I'm also the Director of Education and Student Experience in Exeter Law School. Um, along with Steve, I'm one of the co-founders um, and co-conveners of Legend um, and just generally really into video games. I've researched quite a bit around the role of law and themes like justice in video games and so I'm really glad to be here to talk to you all today. Brilliant, thanks Craig. Uh, Josh, are you, I, I didn't quite see, are you on the call today? Not sure if you managed to make it, I know he had, teach, he had uh, other commitments. Okay, so we've got Josh Warburton, who's also part of our Herd of Nerds. Uh, he's also from the University of Leeds and is a Light Transformation Fellow, which means he's very good at actually implementing the ideas that Craig and I have, because quite often we sit there with these kind of well, wild esoteric ideas and we need someone to kind of bring us back down to earth a little bit. And then we've got Dave Uritich, who quite recently joined uh, our little uh, collective, who's also a lecturer at the University of Extra, Exeter, who has done quite a lot of work in card-based games and the picture you see in the front uh, at the top of the screen there is a card-based game he's developed uh, called Judge which is hopefully going to print um, in, a, in the next few months and if you can see Craig's screen he's got a, a, a working copy there and I didn't actually mention I realized what I do uh, I'm really interested in using game-based learning and in particular uh, analog games to foster engagement and creativity in the legal classroom uh, I've done this a lot with board games and I'm looking to move into uh, a bit of D&D &D or generally RPG based games as well. As you can see on the screen, we're, we're all massive nerds. We're into our tabletop games. That, that's a little bit of Kill Team in the office. For those of you who know, that's a game of Twilight Imperium. I think that was about eight hours into a 10 hour session um, that I had with a group of friends of mine. Yep, 10 hours, that's how long we, we, we play these things. So. We're very much into our, our games from both a social but also a research perspective. So what I'd just like to do is ask question two now on your Padlet. Uh, what is your experience of gaming? We did that a little bit at the start with the introduction from Ian, but I'd just like to get an idea of what are your experiences. And on a simple Likert scale in the chat, if you can just pop in a number where you consider yourself to be. So are you that person that know that games exist but left them in their childhood like Monopoly and Cluedo? Uh, do you play games during the holidays, uh, before the arguments begin, of course? 
Uh, do you play games as a social interaction with friends and family a couple of times a year? Do games form an integral part of your socialization and you try to play them as often as you can? Or are you very much like me? Number five, is your board video or RPG book game collection your precious? Board Game Geek is saved to your homepage and you have a dedicated games room, table or shrine. Or in my case, I recently did until my uh, daughter came along. And I feel like that's just about justifiable enough to give up my games room. Okay. Great, so we're getting the feeling of in the room, we're, we're generally around the threes and fours here. A couple of absolute nerds like me, fantastic. Uh, a couple of you who are number ones, you, you're probably here just to kind of experience what we're doing. That's absolutely fine. We, we will probably use a bit of terminology. We will try and explain it as much as we can. But really what we're trying to do is to understand how you guys engage. Okay, so most of you are gamers or have been gamers in some form of way. Question three then, have you ever used game-based learning uh, within your teaching. So simple again, like hard scale, I forgot to put the numbers on this, so my simple apologies there. Number one, I have never adopted game-based learning. Number two, I have attempted to design activities around game-based learning, but never implemented them. Number three, I have game-based learning. I've used game-based learning once in my learning design. Four, I regularly employ it. Or five, my learning and teaching is predominantly around the use of game-based learning. So for me, I would probably be around about a four here. So that's really, really interesting, isn't it? Because the vast majority of here people here are gamers, but we haven't actually used it for our teaching or our te teaching methodologies. So hopefully today, Craig and I uh, can show you a little bit of what we're going to be doing or planning to do, and maybe encourage you to think about implementing some of these strategies in your own um, uh, teaching. Okay, uh, I'm going to hand over to Craig now, and he's going to talk to you about the, a little bit of the context behind what we do. Hello, um, I'm aware we sort of have a very interdisciplinary audience, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the context of where this project has sort of grown out from. And I think this also is a little bit um, related to sort of that move towards game based learning in, in legal education as well. So this doesn't just sort of contextualise our work, but also looks to contextualise sort of um, what's sort of going on in higher education, particularly in sort of legal education at the moment. Um, this may come as no surprise because you may very well pick up on some of these messages um, within your own disciplines as well. But particularly the legal academy um, has traditionally been very conservative um, in, in the way it is largely approached sort of delivery and development of educational experiences within the law school. Um, I think we all had a very difficult time during the sort of digital pivot to COVID, but in law this was felt particularly strongly because we had been very much based around sort of the sort of Socratic seminar didactic lecture approach. Um, and some of this was constrained by sort of historical regulatory requirements from the Joint Standards Board, which was the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, and the Bar Standards Board in the, U uh, in the UK, who were responsible for essentially regulating the academic stage of, of, of educational training. Now, the Joint Standards Board is no more. The SRA have said you don't need a law degree to become a solicitor, you just need degree level study. And so with that has become a little bit more freedom. This is a very recent thing. We're not necessarily seeing the effects of it yet, but hopefully we will start to see some move away from this relatively conservative um, educational discipline. But this is also where I think law schools have a bit of a bizarre identity. They've often been sort of within the mindset of this idea of uh, sort of training during that sort of idea of the third industrial revolution, but training lawyers to be lawyers, not necessarily training law students or for people to be law graduates. There has been a quite a lot of pedagogy that has focused on um, and, and as it has as, at its primary focus, the development of legal skills. Um, 
and only 50% of law graduates go on to work in the law in some capacity, and it's about 30% go on to actually be practicing lawyers. So we're sort of doing a disservice by thinking just about this idea of training. Now, some of the stuff we'll talk about today will sort of be using sort of legal um, scenarios as part of sort of the training process. But what's different for us is us thinking more broadly about skills for all law students, not making them lawyers. It's about that sort of direct focus on what we want to do. Um, there's been a lot of research done recently around the role of the solicitor in contemporary practice, um, particularly this idea of the millennial lawyer. And they've often been found and described of having sort of an inability to um, sort of be able to be resilient and nimble to receive feedback. Um, it doesn't necessarily take things like mental health that seriously. Legal education is far behind where it needs to be. Um, you'll see on the slide in front of us here is that the legal profession is going through a process of change and there are a number of key skills gaps that law graduates who then the small percentage that do go on to become legal professionals. But again, I think with an interdisciplinary audience here, some of these things that you can see on this list on the slide in front of you here are probably um, quite resonant with um, the sectors that your graduates go on to work in. And, you know, law students go on to work in all kinds of different sectors. But what the research is, has, has been found, particularly that the research that's focused on legal practice, has talked about the idea of them lacking certain technological proficiencies, um, interdisciplinary uh, knowledge, um, emotional intelligence and sort of specific uh, interpersonal skills, sometimes practical ethics and thinking about the sort of um, consequences of um, decision making, as well as being adaptable um, and nimble and having some resilience to changing circumstances. Um, did you want to jump on, Steve, and talk about sort of the this idea of aligning student motivation? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so Craig's speciality is looking at the at, at the students as the, as they move out of the institution, whereas I'm uh, a little bit more in, in, interested in the students whilst they're in the institution. So we've all had those seminars, I'm sure, where we've um, asked that open ended Socratic question. And what usually happens is you think you've got a really interesting question for students to engage with. You ask the question and you get that absolute wall of silence. You sit there for about 10 seconds waiting for the excruciating period to uh, to abate. And then you have the one student who's always done the work, is brilliant and goes and answers it for you. Now, that's a little bit of an extreme example of a, of, a, of a Socratic seminar. But what I'm particularly interested in is looking at students' motivations and how we align student motivations to get them to engage more with the classroom setting. So what we've got on the screen there is just a simple diagram from uh, Ryan and D D Daisy. And what they talk about there is the idea of aligning, moving away from this extrinsic motivation of marks, of will this be on the exam? And moving instead to this idea of intrinsic motivation and making the enjoyment or the inherent task itself motivating enough for students to engage with it. So moving away from that, it's only I'm only interested in this because it's going to get me a mark at the end of the semester. Back to you, Craig. Yeah, and so, you know, while I've sort of talked about the conservativeness of um, higher education, particularly legal education, there are examples of um, game-based learning, gamification, serious play in legal education, but they often sit in sort of these individual silos. They often sit with individual um, innovative or interested colleagues. Um, and what's interesting is just a few of the examples on the slide, and I'm aware it's probably not clear to see there, so I'll just run through just the sort of key headlines very, very quickly, is these often sit as their, their own isolated um, activities within learning and teaching. They don't necessarily draw on a range of different approaches to game-based learning or gamification, for example. So like, Case-based simulations, like simulations have been a big part of, 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 of legal learning, but they often don't necessarily draw then from a range of different pedagogic backgrounds. Um, you know, this idea of like legal quizzes and competitions 
that can link to what's at the bottom of the slide there around negotiations, simulations, mock trials, legislative drafting exercise. They're often gamified, they're often competitions, but they often sit as something a little bit separate. Um, we have examples of interactive learning, role playing exercises do sit, but they're very, very small in the way in which they sit within a program as well as within the academy, academy more generally. I've seen some examples of sort of gamified feedback and progress tracking. However, Again, this is very, very small, often run by an individual um, academic who's interested in this kind of gamified approach to learning and is not something that we find sort of more broadly um, on the uh, sort of programme level. Problem solving games, um, I think that is a stretch to say that problem solving is an important part of the legal education. However, <laughs> I would go as far as to say actually looking at those as games is probably a bit of a stretch where they are encouraged as part of a game then that is um, something that is very very sort of rare and very focused on individual modules or individual uh, members of staff and that's a broad sweep of sort of GBL and gamification across higher education um, but what we have seen is that there is a lot of drive towards gamification and game-based learning in higher education legal education based on around that sort of digital and tech facilitation. Now, what that has done is that has largely looked to what I would argue to update existing and often outdated methods and modalities. There's been a drive not towards innovation, but updating. And how far does this move beyond this idea of practice centered education? It's about this idea of finding some balance and thinking more broadly um, within this idea of, of, of um, developing uh, student skills that it will set them up for a range of different things that they can do. I'm aware I've only got five minutes. So yeah, so we're looking at looking at doing this in a less tech facilitated way, thinking more holistically um, around how uh, the sort of tabletop role playing game um, can be used to allow students to develop a range of different skills. Um, I think the idea of sort of tabletop um, role playing games, the creation of a literverse, a fictional world not yet fully defined, not yet bounded, has a huge and immense potential for the study of law. I think it's fundamental for contemporary legal education. I think it can draw on technology, but I also think that we have the ability to create something meaningful and develop a range of different skills for our students. Do you want to move on to the next slide, dude? Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think that these kinds of skills, particularly addressing some of these skills gaps that scholars are talking about, particularly in legal practice, but also in a range of different um, future sectors, you know, the idea of being able to sort of think creatively, um, adapt to changing circumstances, have some attention to detail, developing self-confidence and resilience in things like decision making, the ability to work under pressure, for example. Um, do you want to move on again, Steve, because I want to get to your design bits. So um, we've started developing a pen, pen and paper RPG called Clients and Courtrooms, again, designed to be cooperative rather than competitive, designed to encourage a range of different skills that I've already mentioned. There is definitely a lacuna in the literature, uh, pedagogic literature around legal education for this. Um, uh, but I'll let Steve talk a little bit about his game design principles um, and where we are with the project at the moment. Fantastic. Thanks, Craig. OK, apologies, everybody. Like a bunch of lawyers, we always talk far too much and love the sound of our own voices. Uh, and when you can combine that with being academics, it makes it 10 times worse. So a couple of minutes, I'm just going to run you through uh, where we're at. So where we're at right now is we're going back to a basic set of principles of what we want our RPGs to look like. And we're using these as, as load stars for us to uh, design what we're doing. So we're thinking about what we're going to be considering. We want a simple set of rules. You know, we're thinking of something like a cairn over a complex set of rules, fifth edition. As we know of anybody who's tried to get anybody into fifth ed, the second you hand them that player handbook, their mind explodes. So you have to kind of dial it down. These students aren't necessarily all going to be gamers, so we need to be thinking about that. And something like a cairn based, you know, three 
um, statistics, statistics style is probably going to be um, more uh, accessible. We're looking at something more along the lines of scripted stories, so something like a fight, fighting fantasy storybooks or a choose your own adventure storybooks compared to something like a sandbox, like a, the Drifter or the Outcast Redemption, uh, Reputation and Redemption. For those who don't know what any of these are, these are all examples of different RPGs that are out there. Uh, we're looking for potentially a self-contained system, something that in itself can do everything. We're not looking to plug in uh, something like a Wolves of Langston for fifth edition. And very much we're looking at these as one shots. We're going to be wanting to do this over a single player session. So uh, oneshotadventures.com is a brilliant resource for anybody who's interested in looking at that compared to something like a much more legacy style game like a Morgborg or a fifth ed Dungeons and Dragons. And furthermore, we're looking for it potentially to be much more around structured play as opposed to just a creative journaling exercise, both of which very much have a place within wider uh, research. But I think for what we're interested in, which is a skills based delivery, we're looking very much more towards that structured play than perhaps giving the students an opportunity for creative journaling like Escape the City or Colossal. Uh, we're going to be doing a tiered approach to our development. We're starting off very, very small because we are very enthusiastic and we know if we jump right into level four, we're going to get lost within uh, <laughs> the idea base and structure. So we're going to start off with a solo tabletop RPG or a curated experience. I'm hoping over a, a series of months and years to level this up to a virtual or online solo RPG with branching narratives. I already uh, uh, deploy uh, digital game-based learning through escape rooms, and we're going to be looking at maybe how to harness some of the technology to do that. Then we're going to move up to potentially multi-part one-shot tabletop RPGs with some form of trained or coached game master. Our hope is that we might be able to use TAs to be able to facilitate this within uh, the legal setting. And then finally, hopefully, the actual dream is getting our students involved in some sort of multi part campaign on a tabletop RPG with some form of Games Master. Now, there's also the obvious elephant in the room. And the final thing I want to uh, look at and say is we've been looking at large language models and the ability of large language models to help us either design or implement some of this stuff. Now, I'm going to be completely honest and say that is my job for the summer. Uh, I have been spending a lot of time looking at LLMs, in particular within one of my roles within the university, which is the digital education academic lead and the effect of ChatGPT, mainly around assessments at the moment. But we're going to be looking at how we might be able to harness that. And if those of you are interested, uh, a YouTube channel, Deck of DM Things, actually did a full AI run with ChatGPT. If you want to Google that and have a look at it, it's really, really interesting. And I'm going to turn it off. Oh, gosh. And that is it, guys. Thank you so much for listening to our talk. I'm fully aware that we probably were close to or went over there. So my apologies, Ian.